take your word for it, Chris. Uh, I know he's a foodie. So um, welcome back to the second half of our session for the day. Now, um, the event today is quite interesting for me in the sense that I get to run into all these faces in the industry who one of them told me has known me for at least 10 years. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't think I've been around for, for that long. I'm quite sure I'm, I'm young enough in the market. So uh, our next speaker, Mr. Stanley Tai, has joined Pang Yuan International as the Managing Director, Financial Institutions Rating. With over 15 years of experience as a financial analyst, Stanley is primarily responsible for covering financial institution sector, including banks, insurers, securities firms, leasing companies, and asset managers. So he's where it is interesting. Stanley started his career in the credit rating industry, where he last served as the director of insurance research at Fitch Ratings. And apparently, he is the man to talk to you about, well, the shifting paradigm for Chinese institutions' credit analysis. Let's have a round of applause for Stanley. Hey, uh, thank you, Liz, uh, for the very kind introduction. I didn't make that up. The first time I met you, it was more than 10 years ago. But anyway, for another day. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, hope you had a chance to digest uh, what Robert had to say about LGFEs and policymaker priorities uh, going forward. Um, last year, deleveraging was obviously uh, the central focus of credit markets. Uh, I think that story is going to continue to unfold uh, in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, to, to me, the two key anchors that have been uh, underpinning the current credit cycle have been, uh, on the one hand, you've got highly coordinated efforts by the financial regulators uh, to rein in excessive leverage in the financial system. Uh, and on the other hand, I think uh, the market collectively uh, still has a very strong belief that we're going to come out of this credit cycle relatively unscathed. Uh, and if you look at the macro data points from last Thursday, the slightly stronger uh, than expected GDP numbers. Uh, th th those new data points seem to have further strengthened uh, the market consensus. Uh, so what I'm really interested in today is your thoughts on the financial sector today. Uh, where do you think the risks lie? And there's really no better way to find out than to ask you directly. So what is the biggest source of risk facing Chinese financial institutions in 2018. Are we still concerned about asset quality? Or are we more, more worried about the funding liquidity side of the balance sheet? Um, are we somewhat concerned about unexpected changes in regulations? Or do we take a longer term perspective and say, uh, perhaps not in the next two years, but if we, if we look out five, 10 years, uh, the risk of disintermediation from FinTech and alternative channels may eventually become a challenge, and it may happen much faster uh, than we expect. Finally, it's something that nobody really talks about a lot, operation risks. Uh, but it's certainly on the agenda of uh, the management and boards uh, at the Chinese banks and other non-bank FIs. OK, so exactly. Okay, well, a little bit less than half of you feel that uh, asset quality is still the number one concern. Uh, 7.1, only 7.1% of you uh, said tighter liquidity is a problem. Now, if we take a step back from macro data, if we forget about Q4 earnings for just a second, uh, it, it's, it's useful to think about the bigger picture. Uh, the development of capital markets in China has always involved a deliberate trade-off between uh, financial system stability and financial innovation. Uh, obviously, that process is dynamic. Uh, the transition from a uh, closed economy to a market-based economy to a much more market-driven financial system, it takes time. And I think, uh, more importantly, 
the interaction between regulators and industry participants will continue to play a very important role. So today, I really want to talk about the Chinese financial industry uh, from that perspective. Uh, we want to share our thoughts on uh, where the banks, where the insurers, uh, where are the other MBFIs positioned in this part of the cycle. Uh, and also, we want to talk a little bit about the evolution of uh, the credit creation models in China. And finally, we're going to share with you our thoughts for 2018. Um, let's start with uh, what we already agree with. Uh, first of all, looking at the onshore uh, fixed income markets, the chart on the top shows you these credit spreads on AAA rated uh, commercial bank paper. Uh, the chart on the bottom shows you the credit spread on AAA rated uh, corporate paper. Uh, if you look at the spread distribution charts to the right, uh, bank paper is trading at about 150 basis points. Uh, corporate paper is at about 160 basis points. So throughout 2017, spreads have widened in the onshore markets. Uh, but if you look at historical averages, uh, we are not that far from uh, where we've been uh, since 2010. Uh, perhaps there's been some sector rotation within that. Uh, so I think some of the onshore investors are slightly worried about financials going into 2018. But I think the uh, supply and demand dynamics are a little bit more nuanced than that. And one of the things that uh, I will talk about is the unwinding of leverage in investors' bond portfolios as a result of the clampdown in shadow banking. Now, what are the markets telling us? Uh, about half of you said asset quality was still a major concern. Uh, to, to, to us, I think, you know, for the most part, I think it, it's been contained. At least uh, we are not that concerned about the big four and the largest joint stock banks. Uh, there are obviously still concerns over the transparency of data. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that nobody really trusts the reported NPL numbers. So where do we go from there? Uh, I think number two, I think only 7.7% of you pointed out that liquidity was on your agenda. And that's really interesting to me because uh, despite the injection of close to 600 billion RMB into the market last week, interbank rates have still edged up. So we're at about 3%. Uh, do we think that we're gonna go back to 2013 when we saw the massive liquidity, liquidity crisis? I think that's unlikely. But will we see something similar to what we saw early last year? I think that's an increasingly likely scenario. I would start to get worried if interbank rates, the seven-day repo rates, when, it, when, when the repo rates hit 35 to 4%, I think some of the smaller banks and MBFIs are going to run into liquidity problems. Um, I think very few of you uh, would disagree that regulations have, for the most part, been effective. Uh, the direction that we are headed is very clear. Uh, we are still going to, uh, the regulators are still going to have a tightening bias, both in terms of liquidity and also in terms of the uh, administrative measures that they uh, put around the, uh, the, the shadow banking uh, ecosystem. <clears throat> now, this slide shows uh, what we call the full credit spectrum. So this is the way I conceptualize the uh, financial services uh, sector in China today. Uh, on the y-axis, uh, we measure asset and capital resilience to deleveraging. Uh, so those risks would include market risks as a result of unwinding uh, in levered positions in the equity and bond markets, uh, and also would include credit risks uh, in, in the bank's uh, asset portfolio in the insurer's uh, bond portfolios. On the x-axis, we've got uh, short-term funding resilience. So while we think that the bigger banks uh, have much stronger capital bases, stronger balance sheets, uh, but short-term liquidity uh, will factor into the equation as well as we go through this period of uh, interbank liquidity tightening. Uh, so at, at the upper right-hand corner, you've got the big four. Uh, 
So we are definitely not saying that they are completely immune to the current environment, but by and large, I think the impact is going to show up in net interest margins. So that's going to hurt their returns on equity. That's going to hurt their earnings. But it's not going to be a balance sheet impact, uh, in, in our opinion. Uh, next to the big four, uh, you've got the insurers. So at the risk of oversimplifying the situation, we've grouped them all into one circle. And the circles, by the way, uh, are drawn to scale. So it would give you a sense as to at least the on balance sheet asset size of the uh, different uh, financial institutions. So what's happening in the insurance sector is uh, they've been uh, increasingly involved in the shadow banking system through the investments in uh, WMPs, trust products, debt investment plans, infrastructure products. Uh, there are all kinds of different names that they uh, call these alternative uh, investments. Uh, but the bottom line is this, uh, they are investing in assets that are much less liquid. These are assets don't have, that don't have secondary markets. Uh, there's no way for a third party market observer to look at uh, an asset on their balance sheet and say, we should mark them, that asset down by 10% or 20%. So, so the, increasing, uh, the increasingly opaque uh, balance sheets of the insurers to us, I think it's going to be a concern going forward. Uh, in the middle of the chart, you've got the joint stock banks. And as we move towards the left, uh, to the bottom corner, uh, you're basically moving in deeper and deeper into non-investment grade category. Uh, the joint stock banks, the city commercial banks, the rural commercial banks, the rural co cooperatives, they all have varying degrees of exposure to shadow banking. Uh, the joint stock banks, on average, uh, have about 25% of their assets in WMPs. Uh, the smaller city commercial banks, on average, have about 15% of their assets in uh, shadow banking products. Uh, the rural cooperatives, uh, about 5%. Uh, but then, uh, as you can see uh, from their position on the chart, their vulnerability really lies on the x-axis. So the smaller banks, the smaller cooperatives that rely extensively on wholesale funding are going to be hit very significantly uh, if the current liquidity situation continues. Uh, and in the middle, you've got the brokers and the MBFIs. The brokers are obviously, uh, in equity investment terms, they are an option play on macro. Uh, in credit terms, they are definitely very vulnerable to financial stability. Uh, we are, we've already mentioned the potential exposure to uh, movements in bond prices, equity prices, when the uh, leverage in the secondary markets uh, unwinds. Uh, the yellow circle, the MBFIs, represent a very, very diverse group of entities. Uh, so you've got the four AMCs. I think from a business perspective, uh, their MPL portfolio pipeline is going to continue to grow. Uh, MPL assets are being priced every day, every week. Uh, I think um, the, the question when I go meet the management at the four AMCs is, are they still pricing these MPL portfolios to their IRR? Or is competition coming from the second tier and third tier AMCs driving up prices of the MPLs and therefore uh, driving down the, their potential returns in these types of assets. <clears throat> now, now, the broad context of uh, sort of how I think about financial institutions, uh, and the, the, I think what, what's really been astonishing to me is uh, in the past decade, the speed of change. Uh, so when, whenever we see uh, a, a some sort of an evolution in the financial markets, it invariably starts with some type of regulatory intervention. Uh, so if, this, uh, if the regulators want to control uh, who they're lending to, uh, how they're lending to these companies, and the interest rates that they're going to charge these companies, uh, the financial sector has always had a way to respond. Um, so if you go back to the basics, 
uh, what we call evolution 1.0 traditional banking. Uh, on the one hand, you've got depositors, you've got the central bank, you've got the other FIs providing funding, uh, you've got corporate A on the right uh, getting funding via Bank A, which essentially acts as an intermediary. Um, so the other FIs also participate in this credit creation process through their investments across the bank's capital structure. So they are major, the insurance companies in particular are major depositors uh, in the banking system. Uh, they are major buyers of uh, senior unsecured debt issued by the banks. Uh, and they are obviously one of the major institutional investors in bank equity uh, as well. So Evolution 1.0 traditional banking, uh, we think it's still going to account for quite a sizable part of the market in the next five years. Uh, it's at, at current levels, it's about 60% of total credit creation. Uh, it's growing at a run rate of about 13%. So is 13% uh, a sustainable level? It depends on your view on sustainable GDP growth. But to me, 13% growth in the core formal lending system seems to support uh, a stated growth rate in the neighborhood of 6.5%. Uh, and like I said, uh, the big four are perhaps not surprisingly picking up market share again in the core banking network as the joint stock banks, as the city commercial banks continue to shrink their balance sheets and uh, rationalize uh, their business models. Uh, the, the, the traditional banking model works well until uh, the two linkages break down. So uh, corporate A, uh, who was previously able to obtain uh, credit from the banks directly, uh, suddenly finds itself in a situation where uh, the, the, the banks that it has relationships with are subject to loan quotas. Uh, some of the banks may not be able to extend credit to them anymore because of changes in uh, lending restrictions. Uh, there are, uh, well, at least until recently, very strict uh, restrict, uh, regulations on loan to deposit ratios. Uh, so that's a, a concern, uh, and that would certainly break the linkage on the right. Uh, on the left, what's been happening is uh, if you look at the last five, ten years, real interest rates in China have stayed at a fairly low level. So households, consumers, they're increasingly finding it that uh, they are not getting a return from their bank deposits that can exceed or at least meet inflation. Uh, that led to, in a way, the growth of the insurance industry, uh, which acts as an intermediary between the longer term uh, uh, bond market and shorter term uh, deposit money, uh, but also a proliferation of shadow banking. Uh, so when uh, the same bank, the same bank teller, the same bank manager tells you uh, you can get uh, a 6%, 7%, 8% annual return on a WMP product uh, when you're just getting 3% on your bank deposit, it certainly sounds very, very appealing. So that led to Evolution 2.0. Uh, at the top, you've got the trust loan structure. Uh, essentially, that's a way for banks to move their loans off balance sheet, uh, and the trust product will eventually end up in the hands of either retail customers or institutional investors. Uh, at the bottom, interest loans uh, have also become some uh, a little bit of an issue, not necessarily because that the banks are uh, liable for the ultimate default risk, uh, but more because of the fact that the, the corporates that are extending credit to other corporates through the banking system tend to be companies uh, that are in, in industries that have uh, excess capacity. Uh, they're sitting on a lot of cash and they're not getting a, uh, an adequate yield on the bank deposits. But these companies are not necessarily uh, risk underwriters. They don't necessarily understand who they are lending to. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, who they are lending to are sister companies. They may be uh, subsidiaries. Uh, but in the past few years, uh, corporates are increasingly lending to entities uh, that are not uh, necessarily affiliated with them in any way.
Now the size of what we call the channel business, uh, what, what's been happening is, uh, especially on the trust end of things, uh, volume growth has actually picked up again. And that is really as a result of the regulators' focus on the peripheral of the shadow banking system. So uh, they want to clamp down on the, the, the murkiest parts of the shadow banking system. Uh, I think in the last two to three years, uh, market participants, investors like yourselves, uh, have come to understand trust structures a lot better. So it's, it's uh, increasingly thought of as uh, one of the more transparent parts of the credit system. And the regulators, although they are con still concerned, although they still want to control that market very tightly, uh, I think they will allow the trust market to continue to grow, uh, perhaps uh, not in double digits, but certainly a growth rate in the neighborhood of 7, 8, 9% would be something that's acceptable to the regulators. <clears throat> And you get to evolution 3.0, uh, you still have corporate A at the uh, lower right-hand corner. Uh, but bank A, uh, to, to avoid mainly loan-to-deposit racial restrictions prior to 2013, they go out of their ways to take a loan asset off their balance sheet. They go through a corporate, they go through another bank, and the asset comes back to its balance sheet as an interbank trust beneficiary right that receives a much lower risk charge under banking regulations compared to uh, conventional loans. So as if that is not bad enough in Evolution 4.0, you lose the corporate altogether. So the banks are using the interbank market as a way to lever up their balance sheet. Uh, so this, the, these types of carry trades work when there's plenty of liquidity in the banking system. Uh, when you can borrow at 2% in the interbank market, uh, it may be worth to uh, invest in something uh, that they call receivable assets from trust companies and securities companies. Uh, which would then turn around and lever up their positions again uh, by posting financial assets like money market funds, equities, and bonds in the interbank market. So it's precisely this kind of excessive leverage that the regulators want to control. Now, one of the ways to gauge the size of the problem is to look at the size of the WMP market which has grown to about four and a half trillion US dollars. Um, if you look at the mix of investors, it's still predominantly a retail market. Uh, although, like I said, uh, MBFIs, uh, the, the uh, insurance companies in particular, have been increasingly active uh, in this space. Uh, on the right, if you look at the assets that are backing these types of WMPs, uh, you've got bonds, uh, you've got equities, money market funds. So we talked about the process of institutional investors delivering their equity and bond portfolios. I think the, uh, it, it's already had a marginal impact on bond prices, uh, but the equity side of things, I think that's going to take a bit more time for the markets to work through. And by our estimation, uh, if you look at the uh, WMPs that have equities behind them. Uh, if we look at the types of leverage uh, that we are seeing in the market, uh, my best guess is uh, the unwinding is going to be in the neighborhood of two to four weeks worth of turnover in the uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange. So, so that's that's quite a bit, and certainly something to uh, look out for. And finally, the last part of the evolution. Uh, fintech. Uh, so banks, uh, in theory, they are very much outside of the system. Until recently, the P2P lending firms don't even have to go through a custodian bank. Uh, but uh, at least, uh, I don't think all 2,000 of them uh, have custodian banks in their business model. But at least we are talking about somewhere around 500 to 700 P2P lending platforms that are now 
placing their customers' money uh, in, in a custodian account. Uh, so if you look at the evolution of the Chinese financial system, uh, we talked about the speed. Uh, we've, uh, but another thing that I think uh, we should emphasize is, uh, for lack of a better term, the creativity of the Chinese financial systems. Now, shadow banking is not a Chinese invention, uh, but I think the Chinese financial institutions have certainly uh, adopted that uh, with uh, Chinese characteristics. Now, what do we expect going forward? Uh, the size of the credit system, like I said, uh, uh, the, the formal banking system, uh, we think, is still going to grow at a rate that is supportive of uh, the state of 6.5% GDP growth. Uh, if you look at the latest data, uh, the shadow banking system as a whole uh, has continued to grow, but at a much uh, slower pace. Uh, I think a more important trend uh, though is uh, the shift from uh, the darker, the murkier uh, parts of the shadow banking system, things like P2P, things like WMPs, uh, back to the more transparent part of the uh, credit creation system, uh, trust products, entrusted loans, uh, bankers' acceptances. <clears throat> now, uh, we, we've talked about it this a little bit. I would watch liquidity. Uh, very carefully. Uh, I think the seven-day repo rate we've already touched on. Uh, the second chart shows you uh, the average three-month interbank negotiable CD rates for joint stock, city, and rural commercial banks. And I think when that uh, when, when the interbank CD rates uh, are above five percent on a consistent basis, it will force the smaller banks to unwind their positions in the WMPs and shadow banking products. And as they unwind those types of carry trades, uh, some of them um, might run into liquidity problems, but at the minimum, I think their interest spreads are gonna suffer very significantly. So the key takeaways, uh, we are more worried about liquidity. Obviously, we are more worried about liquidity than all of you sitting here today. Uh, number two, real NPL ratio has likely peaked. Now, there are any number of ways uh, you can think about uh, MPLs in China. Uh, at a very macro level, you can look at the credit to GDP ratio and say, we've been growing this percent above trend, and therefore, according to the Bank of International Settlements experience, uh, that will translate into X amounts of MPLs in the Chinese markets. Or you can look at it from a bottom-up perspective, uh, and I think Winnie and her team have done extensive work on the different corporate sectors, and she'll go into that in, in just a minute. Uh, but what we've been seeing is that uh, corporate earnings have likely bottomed out, EBITDA margins are on the rise, um, debt to EBITDA ratios are improving, interest coverage ratios are improving. So uh, from a bottom-up perspective, uh, I, I'm increasingly convinced that uh, real NPL ratios uh, have uh, peaked in the market. Obviously, the, the, the operative word there is real. Uh, that uh, the, the report NPL numbers across uh, banks of different sizes will continue to, to uh, differ. Uh, but I think uh, what's happening in the real economy suggests that uh, we, uh, asset quality, uh, that the peak of the asset quality problem may already be behind us. Uh, number three, so, so we are willing to go one step even further. Uh, we will not be surprised to see missed interbank payments by the smallest city and rural banks and cooperatives in 2018. Now, this is not as rare as you would think. Uh, the last time we saw defaults in the interbank was in March, April last year, and rates weren't even nearly as high as what we saw in 2013. Uh, so, Missed interbank payments, interbank defaults uh, among the smaller banks and cooperatives it is certainly a scenario that uh, we are uh, anticipating. Uh, we have to be careful, though, not to interpret that as saying that there will be systematic risk when that happens. I think what matters more when that scenario materializes is the uh, direction and strength, uh, the intensity of further regulatory measures to rein in 
uh, leverage. And finally, uh, let's not forget that there are natural hedges within the uh, FI sector. I think in the coming months, in the coming quarters, uh, you're going to see continued diversity uh, in terms of uh, the types of capital instruments in the banks' uh, structures. You're going to see a diversity in, uh, in, in the types of issuers that will come to uh, the U.S. dollar market. Uh, insurers, for example, uh, by their very nature, they are a natural hedge against banks. Uh, they have much longer liabilities than assets uh, when the situation at the banks is uh, reversed. So uh, even within the financial, financial sector, it may be possible to reduce uh, your risk in a tight liquidity environment. Uh, and that concludes my presentation for the day. Thank you, Stanley. The comments around WMPs and the clampdowns of the shadow banking market, that was super useful. Um, I have a question for you in a minute, but if you have just arrived for the conference for today, um, if you have a question for Stanley, you want to make sure you're logged into our WeChat app. It's included in your conference pack. You just need to scan the QR code, hit schedule, select Stanley's panel, and then you can submit your question. Uh, through the Q&A button we have in the app. Uh, you can also participate in our polling sessions for our, for our later sessions. Um, so be sure you, you want to do that. Now, um, Stanley, certainly, you know, the clampdowns in China around the shadow banking market, that's something we're closely watching uh, for the year, how that's going to play out. So uh, a quick question on that. Now, what do you think? Will the government allow the smaller banks to default if so, should we be worried about the systematic risk? Um, I think the short answer is this. Uh, we, we certainly don't anticipate uh, a run on the bank scenario, uh, although there may uh, be defaults in the interbank. I think it's going to be uh, limited to the city and rural level. That's number one. Uh, point number two is the the regulators are still in a very strong position to provide liquidity to these uh, entities if they do run into uh, funding difficulties. Um, I, I think a, a more fundamental question to me is, uh, in the same way we didn't need hundreds and thousands of guarantee companies in the last decade, in the same way we don't need hundreds and thousands of P2P platforms today, I don't think we'll be needing hundreds and thousands of rural cooperatives in the next decade. So some sort of a government-directed consolidation of the, uh, the, the smaller banks, the smaller cooperatives, I think uh, that, that will have a role to play as we continue as banking financial system reforms continue. Many thanks for that, Stanley. If you have more questions for him, Stanley will be around. Or you can also submit your questions into the Q&A and we will make sure Stanley will get back to you after today's event. Many Thank thanks, you. Stanley. Thank you.